Christopher Hitchens used to say that Bob Conquest was the last man who had a 20th century mind, whose mind comprehended or encompassed the whole of the 20th century. And I recall one time, this would have been in the mid-1990s, when I was sitting next to Bob in the Hoover Commons room. We were both looking at newspapers and magazines. Bob was reading a story about Spain, and he looked up from his newspaper and simply said, 60 years ago, who would have thought that today Spain would have a socialist prime minister and a Bourbon king? And then he went back to reading his newspaper. My first thought was, only Bob. Only in the mind of Bob Conquest would the history of the Spanish Civil War still be so alive, so completely vivid, that he would pick up the irony in today's news. But my second thought, of course, was, wait a moment, Bob was there. Bob actually fought in the Spanish Civil War. Now, he, he always claimed that the only time he discharged a weapon was by accident, but he was there. So it was throughout the 20th century. His mind encompassed the whole story, the whole struggle of that century. But again and again and again, from fighting in the Spanish Civil War to half a century later when he was advising Prime Minister Thatcher on kicking in the Soviet Union, Bob Conquest not only comprehended the 20th century, he took sides. He was there. We've asked a few people to offer their recollections of Bob, to tell us something about what he and his work meant to them, some of his friends, a few professional colleagues, and a few who only admired his work, but as you'll see, admired it greatly. Bob was so much fun. He, he was incapable of being serious without finding some fun. He combined two very important things. Um, the search for historical truth on the one hand, and at the same time, the importance of living a civilized life uh, with an attention to music, poetry, literature, and life itself. He did pathbreaking work, and that's what every academic has to, has to aspire to. I mean, he had insights long before others did about the nature of the evil uh, of uh, Stalinism. One of the most important historians of the Soviet Union in the 20th century, uh, period. To use a line that my husband Christopher Hitchens used the entire time, but I think it's apt and true, it's not what you think, it's how you think. And, and the way Bob thought and the way he expressed himself um, always really kind of left me gobsmacked. Facts matter. Uh, trends in academia, trends in history come and go, but at the end of the day, history has to be recorded, and Bob was militantly committed to that. And I watched as the Soviet Union opened up, as Glasnost happened in the Soviet Union, and conquest went from being a right-wing obscure figure to a mainstream historian because of what we learned as a result of that opening. So facts matter and you need to pursue them at all costs. We were office mates for 20 years. And I would say the way in which he most um, affected my thinking was to attempt to imitate his detachment his professionalism. Uh, he was a, a great historian, and he did it by not letting himself get sucked into the emotions, um, even when he was dealing with a very emotional topic like mass murder, genocide, and so on. Bob Conquest changed every Soviet specialist uh, thinking because he had uh, the imagination and an understanding of that system, its brutality, uh, its systematic brutality. He also changed my thinking because he was just a wonderful mentor and friend. Whenever I was writing uh, as a young academic, I would talk to Bob, and he always had great ideas, and he was always happy to share them with me. Well, she was sort of she was sort of everything to him. She was um, it was a great romantic marriage, one of the greatest marriages I've ever witnessed. They were like two peas in a pod. I used to see them uh, uh, on campus and just think what a wonderful couple they were. She was sustaining for him and uh, someone who took care of uh, life so that Bob could do what he did. 
you know, behind every great man, as they say. She was the one who kind of kept everything on an even keel. Bob was already, in a sense, assured of a place in history as a great historian when he met Liddy. He was, um, in a sense, he had everything except uh, a contented home life. And, um, and that Liddy gave to him. And a, ro a strong romance, which I think continued right to the end of their married life together. Well, I can, I can speak about that because I, I knew her quite well. Uh, I still do know her. She was also very much involved in his uh, career. She understood what he was doing. She was a highly intelligent woman. She was there for him constantly. She was also an extremely nice person, very generous of her time, and very thoughtful of other people. She was a fantastic uh, presence in his life and a, a wonderful friend. Uh, to me as well. You know, the guy wrote more than 30 books, so it's hard to pick a favorite without sliding everything else. The Great Terror is by far my favorite book, and I even have a copy of that uh, Russian translation from 1974, the little tiny book that fits in the palm of your hand. One book called uh, Kalima. Uh, which is about the Arctic death camps, and it's an amazing uh, book that's often overlooked. The one that affected me the most was his book published in 1970 on the nation killers, um, which dealt with uh, <clears throat> the deportations of the peoples of the North Caucasus. The Great Terror is the, the, really the book that we'll all remember. The fact that after the Soviet archives were, uh, were reopened, we learned that uh, Bob was un uh, sadly right about the scale of the destruction um, of Joseph Stalin. This is Penultimate Motto, which is Bob's penultimate book. Uh, the last one was called Bloke Songs, and I had a hand in both of those books. And again, I've never run into anyone who uh, wasn't amused by a clever uh, limerick. And Bob is the master of it. I think he probably wrote, uh, you know, the greatest limerick ever written. There was an old Marxist called Lenin who did one or two million men in. But where he did one in, the great, uh, I blew it. The best one is obviously, uh, there was an old Marxist called Lenin who did one or two million men in. That's a lot to have done in. But where he did one in, that old bastard Stalin did ten in. All right, let's try it again. Uh, there was a great Marxist called Lenin. <laughs> Let me look. <laughs> Let me give it a go. Uh, there was a great Marxist called Lenin who did two or three million men in. That's a lot to have done in, but where he did one in, the grand Marxist, Stalin, did ten in. I really like that uh, limerick. Uh, Bob and I were chatting on the phone. In the midst of the conversation, Bob says, oh, I have to go pee. And I said, well, okay, Bob, I'll call you back then. They said, oh, no, it's a portable phone. I'll just take it with me. I particularly liked his 90th birthday, which we hosted here. Um, and he was surrounded by young women, and he was um, festooned with people who had flown in from all over the world. Um, and he just looked radiantly happy. Well, the man was an enormously nice man and generous man. and. Um, and someone who would do something like that, you know, kind of call you and congratulate you and say nice things about a book you'd written. Bob and I, together with our wives, took uh, to the Soviet Union in 1989 to have a look firsthand at Gorbachev's uh, perestroika. Uh, to our amazement, he was something of a rock star uh, when he arrived. Wherever we went, there was a tremendous commotion. Uh, even when we went to Georgia, there was an extreme interest in this person who had written um, so um, truthfully about Stalin and his crimes. I'm a PhD student at Berkeley still. I'm in my 20s. Here I am, this little kid in a candy store, translating between these two giants. And I got to tell you, even though Rybakov was this colossal figure, he himself was, was out of his mind to be in the same room with Conquest. Rybakov had this look on his face 
like he had been to heaven. And there I was translating this conversation. And so that was my initiation, as it were, into Bob Conquest. I really appreciated his generosity as a scholar. He understood that it was good for him and good for me if we were both learning from each other. Not all scholars are that way. Sometimes it can be a kind of competitive business. He never thought in those terms, and I greatly valued in my own academic career the location of just being next to Bob Conquest for so many years. Um, a friend and I, who she wor he worked for Margaret Thatcher in Downing Street, asked me to write a speech on foreign policy for her. I sat down with him and tried to do it, but I was completely inexperienced. I was a young journalist at the time. And I said, you know, I'm sharing an apartment with Bob Conquest. I mean, he's the man who should be doing this. Well, Bob uh, was introduced to Margaret Thatcher. He agreed to do so. That was the first major speech she made as opposition leader. It was the famous speech, one of two, that led her to her being described by the Soviets as the Iron Lady. And, of course, it set her on the road to becoming an extremely important figure in the end of the Cold War, the resistance of the Soviet Union, the emergence of Gorbachev, and finally the arrival of a world in which that particular quarrel no longer threatened us with extinction. Uh, I was very nervous about meeting someone like Bob, who I admired for so many years. And within two seconds of meeting them, I remember his laugh. He cracked a joke. I can't remember what the joke was. But he had a, a really welcoming, expressive laugh. It just took over the whole of his face. And uh, from then on, I felt, you know, this is a real friend. This is someone who is prepared to talk to a junior uh, as if uh, you could talk on e equal terms with them. And uh, I, I shall never forget that evening. Bob had just a wonderful sense of humor. And uh, I can just always remember whenever something slightly uh, askew would happen or something slightly absurd, he would say, well, really, is that is that really the case? And you'd say, well, yes, Bob, that's really the case. And he would say, really? Unbelievable. And I loved it when he told me it was unbelievable. Then I had to go back and check my facts. From Bob's final book of poetry, Robert Conquest, New and Collected Poems, let me just close with a brief poem by Bob himself, entitled simply, So. The poem calm stands in the eye of the storm, at most ruffled a bit by stray residuals of breeze. The poem, grim, is caught in the eye of the storm, a world's deep, seething pit of dungeoning darkness. The poem, firm, sees with the eye of the storm, up and out through the starlit perspective of infinities. George Robert Ackworth Conquest, 1917 to 2015, a historian of the first importance, a great artist and a good man. <laughs>